talk to you about a bit of the um, vertebrate work that, that's been going on at SAFE for the last five years under the HMTF programme. And like most things with people here, it's, it's actually not done by me, it's done by everyone in my group. So they, they can claim all the credit. I just come up with some ideas and make pretty maps. What am I doing here? Okay. Okay, so um, we're working into the, um, the Lombok programme. Um, which uh, is comprised of four uh, work packages, and the things that we're concerned with more are landscape correlations between ecosystem functions and biodiversity, um, linking up to the, um, the policy-facing side um, of the programme, which um, Jake Bicknell will talk to you a little about a bit shortly. Um, so I want to cast your minds back to five years ago, or six years ago, when we, we started the HMTF programme, and the, the Lombok side had two main deliberations at that point. The first one was how to come up with a snazzy acronym like Bali. <laughs> we failed on that one. The second one was um, whether we genuinely thought that there was a realistic chance of there being any oil palm at safe within the five-year um, programme. And Eleanor and I looked into our um, crystal balls and we decided that there wasn't, wasn't going to be any oil palm. <laughs> so we went further afield. So um, we're, um, been, we've been much more interested um, in what goes on outside of the safe area um, than what happens inside. And this map here is from the uh, Hanson Forest Cover <coughs> Change data set. And it really sets in stone the idea that what happens in, on InterSafe um, is the, the latest um, land use transition um, representing what's happened around the landscape for, for um, many kilometers away from that area. Um, so the, the blue are the colours, the, um, the, um, the longer ago the forest was cleared. Okay, so a bit further away. So, so we're working, um, this is safe, uh, we're working in these landscapes here, um, Bentawausa and Sabah Softwoods, and we've also done some work up here um, in the Enterprise um, Sarajaya, uh, Sarajaya plantations as well. So we've been looking at um, the transitions from forest through to log forest, through to all palm and everything in between. So the, there's four main um, projects that I've got a brief to talk to you about, but I'm only really going to be able to fit in information about the mammal thresholds and bird thresholds. So for the mammal threshold work, we um, are working at the standard safe sites um, at the, and the LFE, 130 uh, camera trap locations um, across this um, landscape here. Um, but some of them are matched onto safe points, many of them aren't, they're about a kilometre to two kilometres apart. Um, for the bird threshold work, we're working again on the safe, um, safe block and point design, but we've also extended the riparian design into 18, I think 18, 18, 18 other um, riparian reserves out into the landscape. So. Um, beyond the immediate borders of, of SAFE, but also further afield um, in the uh, Enterprise Foundation as well. So that's 356 point counts, including 20, uh, 18 additional rivers, actually, and um, also um, data from Maliao, Danum, and Sepalok. And then we have uh, data from uh, leech eye DNA and predator-prey um, data um, from isotope and metabarcoding, um, just looking at forest degradation within SAFE. I'm just going to focus on the threshold work. So the context of this for the Lombok proposal is looking at co-benefits, um, specifically between bio forest biomass carbon um, and biodiversity and, what, and whether one can predict the other. So um, we were very much interested at the onset of the, of the programme to look at the policy framework for this. And at that time, the high carbon stock approach was gaining traction. Um, in all palm certification and other certification systems. So this is a methodology that's being used to address zero deforestation pledges. It's now embedded within the, the um, RSPO framework. And essentially what it is, you, you, you map and stratify land within an all palm um, estate according to different carbon strata, although they don't actually match the carbon, but they did in the old days. Um, and then it's assumed that the areas of denser carbon um, uh, represent high levels of biodiversity. So we were seeking to validate that approach. And uh, Nick Deer worked on this for his PhD. Um, he's published it last year or year before. And this was essentially a validation using 4,500 uh, camera trap nights, 142,000 
um, I've been told to say bloody photos, not photos, bloody photos, and 115 uh, cameras uh, were viable in that system. Um, and um, so no surprise, really, that uh, high-carbon um, strata um, represent the highest diversity um, of mammals. Um, so anything in the continuous log sites, the Ulysses gamma, the more denser forest strata within the fragments around SAFE, they, they um, host the largest amount of mammals, whether you split them by threat, and state, threat status or uh, disturbance sensitivity. All palm has significantly fewer mammals. Um, um, but there's actually a, 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 bit, a bit of a messy ground in everything in between. And we always attri we attributed that to possible misclassification errors when you are stratifying um, the area according to carbon strata using satellite images. But actually, a lot of it is most likely down to the fact that it's not all about biomass. It's about all these other structural characteristics of the forest that might drive whether a, um, a site is occupied or not occupied by a mammal. So we looked into that a bit further using the magic LIDAR data. So we made friends with David and his crew. Um, and we were using, I was hoping David was actually going to go about over all of the different covariates because I can't remember all of them, but he can tell you about them later. So this is the LIDAR area here um, for SAFE. And Nick um, undertook another camera trapping study, this time um, having all the camera traps within the LIDAR area and this time using a pad camera design, which is better for improving your detection probabilities for all of the, the, uh, the cute and rare and fluffier mammals that, that mammal people tend to care about, but a uh, statistically complete mission to actually work with. Um, but he needed convincing, otherwise he was going to quit his PhD. So he did it. <laughs> and the idea here is that you can stratify the forest in a similar way or any way you want. Um, and you can match all of these points to LIDAR data um, and from various buffer distances, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to go over the horrible model, not least because I don't fully understand it. But he has developed a, a hierarchical, uh, multi-species, multi-scale occupancy mo model that basically accounts for habitat use structured at different spatial scales. So it's supposed to represent more of the home range requirements of, of a mammal at uh, larger scales, but then also the sort of uh, camera or location-based um, structural information, which might dictate what, what, how the animal is actually using the forest environment at the point in which it's detected. And it's Bayesian, just to, in case you weren't uh, convinced it was complicated enough. So it's counted for site level processes, camera station level processes, um, a temporal replicate and all this other pseudo-replication thrown in. And it also borrows information at the community level. So for species that you have poor detection for, it can borrow information from congeners elsewhere within the community. And in the camera trapping community occupancy world, this has demonstrated time and time again to be a much better way to do your camera trapping and your occupancy models. So we used it. So he has the covariates from the LIDAR at multiple spatial scales, um, uh, site-based, um, covariates extracted at um, uh, two kilometer buffers, so Z, large scales like this, and um, six variables at uh, camera location buffers, um, 250 and 500 meters were the best ones. Because all of these different scales are, are, have varying degrees of collinearity, you actually have to do a hell of a lot of models to work out the best one, um, and it took about three and a half months. And what we find is that um, Mammals collectively are incredibly vulnerable to structural degradation um, over and above how they are vulnerable or sensitive to the um, carbon profiles of the forest. So for the five main characteristics that we're, we're looking at, we see gradual change um, in the structural um, composition of the forest from the old growth forests through to the remnant forest outside the safe area in the Palm estates. So um, this logging disturbance is characterized by a lower height profile, reduced um, vegetation density, less connected canopy paths, spatially disturbed canopy, all these things that we are, we are measuring with the LIDAR data. Um, and we find that at the second order um, of the model, so this is the, the site level, the, the two kilometer scale, um, most of the mammal species are responding very strongly to forest cover availability but also the height of the, of the forest. 
but at the proximate scale around the camera trap point, they're responding much more strongly to plant area density. So essentially different structural com components of the, of, of, of the forest um, are, are structuring the mammal community at different ways at different scales. But they're all responding in a uh, broadly similar way collectively at the, the community level. So this is community level occupancy. And then these, these here are all, all the main species that we modelled um, and the uh, occupancy response being positive or negative against the uh, LIDAR covariate. And they're rescaled to the community level response of zero. So if they're over this side of the line, they're responding positively to that, to that um, st structural measure. Um, so you, you'll have things like specialists here, clouded leopards responding in a consistently a positive way to uh, more complicated structural properties of the forest and then you have more generalist species responding in a, in a negative way or not responding at all. Okay, So you've got these idiosyncratic responses of species but then building up to, uh, speech, uh, to community level responses as well. Note that none of these responses are linear. Um, and so this is where I think it gets more interesting because I'm more interested in the application of the data rather than characterising the mammal community, yet another camera trapping study somewhere in Borneo. Um, so, which is very interesting, but we don't need another one, um, <laughs> unless we're doing something different. So um, what we were then looking at after this point was, because the, these relationships aren't linear, um, we started using um, Bayesian change point analysis to work out where the important tipping points or thresholds were in that nonlinear curve where, that dictate where there's a disproportionate increase in occupancy to, um, in, in association with a LIDAR metric or a drop in occupancy. And so, so these, are, these are the change point analysis here. So um, essentially these vert vertical lines are showing you where there's an abrupt increase in occupancy with an increase in that metric. And then past this, this second zone here, this is where it's the highest or most optimum um, structural property, right? So if you extract all, that in, all those LIDAR pixels of, um, of the climb in each of these curves, these are the areas where if you can expect if you increased or improved the structural properties of that cell, you would have a disproportionate increase in occupancy or a higher maximum likelihood, actually, specifically, um, in, in occupancy in that cell. Whereas here, at the, at the sort of peak occupancy, these are the areas where you should expect species oc mammal occupancy to be high simply because the structural properties are already good. So these increased areas here would match onto areas where, that you, where you could prioritise for restoration. So these are these brown areas here where it's reclassified. And the peak occupancy parts here would, would be the best places for conservation. So this is an example here for clouded leopard. So because we've got the models for all of the covariates, we're able to look at the, op at, the, at the consensus of all of those different LIDAR variables for, e for give any given species. So for clouded leopards, these, these are ones that, that mammal, mammal people care about, IOCN care about, but we can in principle do it for any species, and then we can map those areas um, whichever way we want, we want with those data sets. So that's one application. And then the other one, which I think is po um, possibly of interest for the virtual rainforest um, is when you start passing this information down to, to key groupings of species, particularly functional groups. And that's quite interesting for, for mammals, but because we were only working with about 20, 28 species, um, there's, a, there's a, the limitations about what you can realistically do in terms of the number of groups and the composition of those groups. Whereas for birds, we have a lot more species and a lot more information. So Simon Mitchell, another one of my uh, students, uh, repeated um, a whole bunch of bird surveys that David Edwards started a while ago. Um, and he worked with 10,000 bird observations for repeated point counts at more than 350 points, matched onto the safe network, but also in these riparian zones outside, and also um, in other old growth areas in Sabah. Um, and if you're, more in, if you're interested in more of the sort of habitat effects there, you can look at his paper from last year. But the great thing that he's been doing recently is he's been splitting these responses into different groupings. So we can group them by strata, whether they're understory specialists, midstory or canopy. Uh, we can split them by feeding girls, whether they're frugivorous, gleaning, insectivores or nectarivores or 
um, pescivores, etc., etc. But we can also uh, pass them by habitat association as well, all combinations of all of those things. Because here the species are the building blocks within each of the groupings, and there are many species, so there are many ways by which that could be done. So because there are many species and many groupings, that means if you're using a Bayesian um, uh, analysis, it gets horrifically complicated. So he coupled this occupancy analysis with a, uh, a relatively simpler piecewise regression, which basically uses the maximum likelihood to detect a break in an otherwise linear relationship. So you're, you're fitting linear curves to all of these occupancy, species occupancy profiles for all of the LIDAR curve areas, and then testing whether a, a, um, a break point would, um, a non-linear relationship would fit better. Um, and this is done for five covariates, the most important of which are forest cover, canopy height, and skew. And you can do this for every species, so 173 of 205 species in the community. And the important thing to note here is that the species responses are incredibly idiosyncratic. So even though we, we know how specialists respond or frugivores respond, actually each species has its own unique response. And they could be um, positive or negative. They could be, have no break point or they could have a break point. The break point or the threshold could be uh, higher or lower. So what, uh, one species could respond disproportionately higher at 50% forest cover. Another one could be 20% forest cover. So this captures all those idiosyncrasies in a much, much better way than traditional, um, traditional analyses. Um, and so we found that this threshold approach um, basically it, it provides improved fit for 82% of all of the species for forest cover, 95% of all the species for canopy height, 75% of all the species for plant density, etc., etc. And of all of those species, we're getting only a subset, maybe about 25-30% of them are actually responding in a positive way to a lot of these structural properties and, and um, a subset of them are responding negatively. Because you can use the species as building blocks, you can then look at the responses of the different functional groups. So if you're then just interested in functions rather than species, you can look at whether the, the breakpoints are or the thresholds are high or low for particular ones. So for example, um, Frugivores rapidly rise in, in occupancy after about 10 metres in canopy height, whereas for um, terrestrial insectivores, they're responding much, much rapidly after 25 metres in occupancy. OK, so the other, other data sets I have no time to talk about beyond a slide each are Queen Mary, University of London. There are data on predator-prey interactions from metabarcoding and isotope analyses. Rosie Drinkwater has some great data on um, iDNA from leeches for mammal. Um, occupancy that's revealing key seasonality um, differences in occupancy over the landscape. And then from um, DICE side, we're continuing the canopy trapping in the canopy. Um, Jess Hayson's just finishing that off now and finding that um, it takes a lot longer to get decent detection histories in the canopy, but you can still get quite interesting data on structural use there. Um, and then there's a paper on orangutan densities um, out in the oil palm as well as in the forest from Dave Seaman. And then Henry and his group have data on um, mammals using the riparian zones out in the oil palm as well. Okay, um, and the last thing to say is that there's a lot of riparian data that I've not been able to talk about, including microclimate data from the data loggers as well. So if you're, anyone's thinking about redoing the, the mapping of um, key microclimate attributes. We have a whole bunch of have a network of about 90 data loggers out in the all palm and riparian zones that might help improve some of those fits. Okay, sorry, my neighbor.